Dave for that. Dave Nagel. Thanks so much, Howard. And thanks to everybody for coming out. Um, I normally have a slideshow that I give. And I actually usually talk for about an hour. <laughs> and I can talk even longer about killer whales because I'm one of those guys who can just ramble on for hours about these creatures because they are so amazing. Um, and that's part of what I wanted to do with the book. Um, I give a lot of science and include a lot of science in the book, um, but I also wanted to do something that scientists can't really do, which is to sort of express the sense of awe that these creatures inspire in us. And it's, it's not just sort of a magical sense, I think it's actually a very rational <laughs> response. Not just to, not just to seeing the animal when they, um, when we encounter them. I mean, they are so large and so beautiful and, and so amazing to see. But more than anything, they also have real presence. And you know, when you're looking at them and when you're dealing with them, that that these are not just any ordinary animals. And so, yeah, I've, I've got usually give it a little slideshow. <clears throat> One of my favorite slides I give early on shows a. An MRI of a killer whale brain, uh, which really is pretty impressive, and there's a copy of it in the book. The um, killer, I, most of you probably know that killer whales have the second largest brain of any animal on the planet, but you may not know is that it's also the most gearified brain of any animal on the planet. Uh, gearification is the amount of cortical folding that is in the brain. Uh, killer whales gearification index is about 5.7. Uh, human beings, in contrast, are about 2.2. So, uh, these guys have really big CPUs. And a lot of that, you know, we figure is probably devoted to echolocation. But even that means that they're devoting huge amounts of their t intelligence to seeing in ways that human beings are simply incapable of. And this means that their world is much richer and more complex than I think we can even possibly conceive. Um, what I really want to talk about today, of course, is Lolita and the issue of captivity and how that opens a window onto the world of wild killer whales, particularly the southern residents. Um, Lolita's uh, capture is we all heard from Sandra, uh, was part of this horrendous travesty. Um, and it's gone on for 45 years. I went down and saw her in January of 2013 at her tank. And I have to tell you, the first thing that strikes you, it's hard to convey in photographs and videos, but it's really shocking uh, how tiny and how crappy her little tank is. I mean, Miami Seaquarium is a dump. <laughs> it really is. It's a crumbling, ancient, 50-year-old facility, and it looks every bit of it. They try to put paint on it and stuff, but it still places a dump. And it's really shocking how tiny her tank is. You know, it's 80 feet wide at the widest spot, and she's 20 feet long. So that means she just needs a little couple flicks of her flutes, and she goes from one side of the tank to the other. And it doesn't even come close to providing the amount of space that a wild animal should. And particularly if you see her family in the wild, you know, if you've seen them out there, you know that these animals do not belong in captivity. Now, now I've got to say, one of the things about captivity, the whole captivity period, is that it did, there's no question that it really changed um, public perceptions about killer whales, particularly among uh, Western Europeans. Uh, it changed the way people saw them from this. But prior to the 1960s, these were animals that were widely considered voracious killers, the most vicious animal you might find in the water. Um, <clears throat> they'll kill you even faster than a shark, blah, 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 blah. Of course, none of this is true, right? Killer whale has never harmed a human being in the wild. Captivity, that's a different story, and that's part of our story. Uh, but um, these 
animals don't belong. Well, but what we did, what we learned in the 60s and 70s was that they're gentle and cooperative and very intelligent. And we actually were able to put them in these tanks, to the extent that you could put them in these tanks for extended periods before they grow psychotic. <laughs> but, um, but inevitably they do go psychotic because these are one of the things we've also learned in the 50 years since we started taking them captive is that they don't belong in captivity. Uh, they, these are animals that were evolved over millions of years to swim constantly uh, at depth and up to, you know, they'll swim up to 100 miles a day in the wild. Putting, putting them in a tiny little pool where they go around in circles is just cruelty. And then on top of that, what we now know about their echolocation is that it's this really exquisite sixth sense that lets them perceive the world in a way that we just can't. So putting any a creature like that into a tight, plain concrete tank is roughly the equivalent of putting a human being into a plain white closet and leaving them alone. Because it's basically a form of sensory deprivation and incredibly cruel. Well, now we know these things about killer whales, and um, it's helping, helping to build the impetus to actually do something about it. And Lolita is probably the very best candidate um, for release. There are others that probably need to get out. Uh, I think Kashamek down in uh, South America is in such a horrible, tiny little tank that his case is getting urgent, as is uh, Morgan's case in. Uh, in Laura Parque, uh, she's getting torn to bits by the whales that she doesn't belong with. Um, but those are those are other animals that are also candidates. But Olita is far and away the most intriguing candidate, partly because one of the things. I mean, let's be frank: we would learn so much about killer whales if we were able to put her in these waters and see what would happen. Uh, in terms of her relationship with her natal pod because we've, we've learned so much about the kind of long-term memory they have, the depth of their social ties, uh, their ability to retain language and communications, uh, and just an incredible amount that we can learn from doing that. But that's not the reason we want to do it. The reason we want to do it is because she's been in this pit for 45 years and <laughs> deserves to be, deserves to have a life. Uh, even if it's just in the sea pan. Um, one of the things that I do explain in, in my book is that the 58 whales that were taken out, this Sanders book exquisitely uh, illustrated, 58 whales that were taken out of this population were primarily young whales. So what we really lost during that 12 year capture period was entire generations worth of reproductive capacity. <laughs> and so, um, one of the guys I interviewed was uh, Bryce, and other lingering issues that, that continue to plague this population. Right now, the big, best thing we can do is to get them more salmon. Uh, there's nothing we can do about the lost reproductive capacity, but we need to be able to make sure that they have enough food in order to actually build their, their numbers back up. Um, hopefully that uh, with the return of uh, certain, we're getting a lot more reproductive females, particularly in J-Pod. Uh, so there's actually some hope, long-term hope for the J-Pods, long-term prospects. Um, L-Pod, as Brad, Brad Hansen points out, is its long-term prospects reproductively are fairly grim. Um, <clears throat> but uh, J and K pods both look like they could have, have the potential to recover pretty well. Just a matter of making sure that they're all fed. So um, let's tear those dams down and uh, <laughs> let's do what we can to recover the salmon here in, in Puget Sound too. Uh, there's a long road ahead for all of us. Uh, we need to do things about recover the salmon runs, not just on the Fraser River, but also on the Skagit River and on the Nisqually. 
those are the really big river systems that have the potential to put in large numbers of salmon in the sound. So <clears throat> that's something that those of us who are orca advocates uh, can all get behind. I think there are also things we can do, like uh, advocate the use of uh, rain gardens uh, to catch runoff, because we're discovering that runoff, uh, urban runoff in these areas is really toxic to salmon, particularly young salmon. Uh, so the more we can get people to use rain gardens, which catch the runoff and keep it from running into the sound, uh, the more we'll be helping clear whales too. Most of all, you know, I subtitled the book What Killer Whales Can Teach Us, and uh, I think that there are quite a few things that they can teach us, one of them, which is that um, empathy is actually an evolutionary advantage, uh, and that building a society based on cooperation is actually something that's good for our long-term prospects as a species. Um, but I think also they, they definitely challenge our view of ourselves as the only intelligent species on the planet, sort of as I indicated with the big brain. And um, because of that, we, I think, really have ethical obligations to these animals, both in the wild and in captivity. And um, those are ethical obligations that uh, extend beyond just wishing them well. I think we actually need to take concrete steps to make their lives better, both those who are in cap captivity and those that are in the wild. So that said, um, I guess, see this is the problem with not having my slideshow. <laughs> I don't really have a, a wrap up line today, but um, thanks for listening. I'll. Uh, be happy to sign any books that anybody has afterwards. And again, thanks to Howie for having me.